This is the periodic table of the elements. It shows all of the matter. So there are different types of matter called elements. Each box in this table represents an element. Elements are the basic ingredients of everything. Think about a cookie. If you had a cookie, you could say that it's made of flour, butter, sugar, and eggs. Now think about yourself. You are a human, a living thing. You are made of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. These elements that you're made of, we can find on this table. Here's the carbon, here's the nitrogen, here's the oxygen, and here's the hydrogen. Each element has a distinct unit called an atom. So an atom is like a piece of an element. Just like how you can have two cups of flour in your cookies, we can talk about having two atoms of hydrogen in water. An atom is made up of three parts. An atom has a proton, a neutron, and an electron. Protons are positive, neutrons are neutral, and electrons are negative. These three parts are called the subatomic particles. They are arranged in a specific way to form the atomic structure of an atom. So here we're looking at three different atoms and their atomic structure. You can see the red ones are the protons, the yellow are the neutrons, and the gray is the electrons. The protons and the neutrons are together in the center and they form the nucleus. Then the electrons orbit the nucleus. So here you can see an electron orbits the nucleus. Notice too that the electrons have paths that they follow when they orbit the nucleus. This path that the electron is following is called its orbital. So let's go back up to the periodic table and relate some information from it to these diagrams of the atoms. So back up here, remember we said that each box represents an atom. So let's take carbon to look at first. Notice that there is a C there. Here is carbon and it has a C. That C is the atomic symbol. So C stands for carbon. We can look next to it here. We have an N. N is for nitrogen. Next to that, we have O, which is for oxygen. These are pretty simple. Some of them are kind of tricky because they go by their Latin names. You look here, you have Na, and just below it, you have K. Na is for natrium, which we know as sodium. So when you look at the chart and you see an A, that stands for sodium. Potassium is the K, because K is for kalemia. So one of the pieces of information we can get from the table is the atomic symbol, which stands for the name. Notice also in each of these you have a number right above the atomic symbol. That is the atomic number. This atomic number tells us how many protons are in the atom. You can then assume that the atom has the same number of electrons. So if we go back to our ones we looked at, carbon has a six above it, so there's six protons and six electrons in carbon. Nitrogen has seven of each, sodium has 11 of each, and potassium has 19 of each. 
We need this information when we make the diagrams. So let's go back down here now to our diagrams. And let's make some diagrams of some of these atoms. We'll do carbon first. So to make a diagram of an atom, we're going to draw a circle to represent the nucleus, and we'll put the symbol there. So we're going to put a C there so we know we're drawing carbon. Now go back to the periodic table and see how many electrons carbon has. Carbon has a 6 above it. We can assume then that it also has 6 electrons. So we're going to draw our first orbital. The first orbital can hold 2 electrons. So we'll put two electrons here. But we need six total. So now we add a second orbital. The second and the third can each hold eight electrons. We need six total. We already have two in the first. So we're going to put four electrons here. There's our diagram of carbon. It has two electrons in the first orbital, four electrons in the second. That gives us our total of six electrons. Let's do oxygen now. If you come back up here, find oxygen. Oxygen has an eight above it. So we're going to make a circle. We'll indicate that it's oxygen. We know that we need eight electrons total. The first orbital can hold two. We still need six more. So we'll put a second orbital and we'll put six there. There's our eight total. Let's do one that's a little bigger. Let's go to sodium. Now remember, sodium goes by its Latin name natrium, so we have to look for Na up here. Sodium has an 11 above it. So we need a nucleus. We're going to put Na there so we know that we're drawing sodium. And we need 11 electrons total for this sodium. Our first orbital can hold two. Our second orbital, remember, can hold up to a max of eight. So we're going to go ahead and put all eight here. That's two and eight, that's ten. We still need one more. So now we're going to add the third orbital, and we'll put that one more there. Now we have our 11 electrons total. So the rule is you fill from the inside out. And your orbitals have to be full before you add another. Let's do two more examples. We'll do a small one and we'll do a big one. Let's do hydrogen. That's one of the main elements in your body. Hydrogen is up here on the top and it has a one above it. So we're gonna put our nucleus with the H and indicate that it's hydrogen. It has an atomic number of one, so there's only one electron here. So we only need the first orbital, and we put our one electron there. Now we're going to do chlorine. Chlorine is Cl. Here's chlorine. And it has 17. So the atomic number, 17, tells us that it has 17 protons. We can assume that it has the same number of electrons. So we make our nucleus. We'll put a Cl in there so we know we're making chlorine. Remember, we need 17 electrons total. So we put our first orbital. You try to work ahead of me on this. Think about how many electrons we're going to put in the first orbital. Hopefully, you came up with two. We're still not at 17, so we'll add our second orbital, and we're going to put all eight in there. Two and eight gives us 10. Because these two are full, we can go ahead and add a third orbital. Remember, we couldn't add a third orbital unless we already had 10 electrons in the first two. 
but we still need seven more in order to get to 17. So we can add a third orbital and put those seven there. So this is an introduction to the atomic structure and the periodic table. In the next section, we're going to see how we can use this information, these diagrams of atoms, to see how they go together to make Now that you know about the periodic table and atomic structure, we're going to build on that knowledge to look at the formation of molecules. So as you just read in the book, a molecule is two or more atoms bonded together. So we're going to look at atomic structure and see how atoms will bond to each other. Let's start with a couple of carbon atoms. So go ahead and do two carbon atoms. So remember, make a C, represent the nucleus. And if we look up here, we find carbon. Right here is carbon. And it has an atomic number of six. So that means it has six protons. We can assume it also has six electrons. We're going to put two electrons in the first orbital, and that leaves four for the second orbital. Let's draw another carbon next to it. These outer electrons are called valence electrons. So whatever's in the outer shell is the valence electrons. And in the case of carbon, it has four valence electrons. There's a rule called the octet rule, or it's sometimes referred to as the rule of eights. If the second or third orbital is the outer one, the valence one, the atom wants eight electrons. So an atom wants eight valence electrons. So these carbon atoms have four valence electrons, but they want eight. So in order to get eight, they can get together and share. So if we have one carbon atom, with its two and its four. And then we make the other carbon atom like this so that their valence overlap. They can share those electrons. This is called a covalent bond. So these atoms are now bonded to each other. We now have molecular carbon. We have C2 because they are sharing those valence electrons. Another thing that can happen is an ionic bond. So let's draw sodium and chlorine. So if you go back up to your periodic table, Find sodium, it's right here, and chlorine is over here. Sodium has 11 electrons, chlorine has 17. So let's draw these two atoms. So in order to get to 11, we have to add that third orbital and put one electron in it. So there's sodium. Now let's draw chlorine. Chlorine has 17. We're going to do our 2 and our 8. It gives us 10. And then we have to add a third orbital and put 7. So sodium has one valence electron. Chlorine has seven valence electrons. 
Now you might be thinking, oh, they could get together and share also. But that's not what's going to happen in this case. This is going to be a different situation. They both want eight. But in this case, the easier way to get eight is for sodium to give an electron to chlorine. So let's look at chlorine. Let's redraw chlorine now that it has received an electron from sodium. So there it is. It has three orbitals with eight valence electrons. So chlorine's good. It's happy. It has its eight valence electrons. Now let's look at sodium. Okay, it gave away that one valence electron. It no longer has a third orbital. Now we only put two orbitals on sodium. And notice the second orbital already has eight. So now it's good. They both have eight valence electrons now. which is what they want. Atoms want eight valence electrons. But let's look at how we change them. Remember, sodium's atomic number is 11. That means there are 11 protons here. Let's count our electrons. We have two and we have eight. So we have 10 electrons now because we used to have 11, but we gave one away to chlorine, so now there's 10. Notice that the protons and electrons are no longer equal to each other. You have one more proton than you do electrons. So if you add this up, 11 positive things and 10 negative things comes out to positive one. So we now have sodium that has a positive charge. This is called a cation. Cations are atoms with a positive charge. Let's look at chlorine. Its atomic number is 17. So that means there are 17 protons. But if we look at the electrons, we have 2 and 8 is 10, plus another 8 is 18. So we have 17 positive things, 18 negative things. That adds up to negative 1. So chlorine now has a negative charge. And an atom with a negative charge is called an anion. So these are both ions now. An ion just means a charged atom. And you can have two types of ions. If it's positive, it's a cation. If it's negative, it's an anion. There's an old saying, you probably know this, about opposites. What do opposites do? They attract. So anytime you have a cation and an anion, they will attract because they have opposite charges. So now your positive sodium is attracted to the negative chlorine. And they get together and you get NaCl, sodium chloride. And I'm sure you have this in your kitchen and you eat it every day. This is table salt. So now our atoms are sodium and our chlorine are attracting to each other because the sodium's positive, the chlorine's negative, and opposites attract. So this is an ionic bond. Next, we have hydrogen bonds. So for a hydrogen bond, we're going to look at water. Water is H2O. 
So let's come back up here. Here's hydrogen, has an atomic number of one. Here's oxygen with an atomic number of eight. So let's go draw these atoms. So we're gonna have oxygen has two electrons, six electrons. There's our eight. Hydrogen only has one. And it's H2O, that means there's two hydrogens. So we need another hydrogen here. So remember the octet rule, oxygen wants eight. Now, hydrogen doesn't have a second or third orbital. It only has one orbital. So it does not want eight. That rule doesn't apply to hydrogen. But hydrogen can help oxygen get eight. So notice oxygen has six. It needs two more electrons. Each hydrogen has one electron. So that's why it's H2O. So they're gonna get together and they're gonna share. And water molecules kinda look like Mickey Mouse. They end up like this. Here's your two hydrogens, here's your oxygen. So again, this is a covalent bond, but this is a polar covalent bond. So the hydrogens each share their electron with oxygen. But the sharing isn't equal, it doesn't go two ways. Pretty much hydrogen's letting oxygen borrow its electrons. So this means that at any given time, oxygen would have two electrons in its inner orbital and eight electrons out here in the valence, which would give oxygen 10 electrons. Hydrogen, most of the time, has zero electrons because it's letting oxygen borrow its electrons. Oxygen, remember, has an atomic number of eight, so it still has eight protons. If you add this up, it comes out to negative two. Hydrogen each has an atomic number of one, so each has one proton. At the hydrogen end of the molecule, you have a total of two protons and zero electrons. So this adds up to positive two. That means that in a water molecule, the oxygen end is negative and the hydrogen end is positive. This is polar. Polar means it has opposite ends. So water molecules have a negative oxygen end and a positive hydrogen end. So then think about what happens if you put two water molecules together. If we have a water molecule here that's positive hydrogen end and negative oxygen end, and we add another water molecule. The negative oxygen end of one is attracted to the positive hydrogen end of another. So you have an attraction right here. That attraction is a hydrogen bond. A hydrogen bond is an attraction between the negative oxygen end of one molecule to the positive 
hydrogen end of another. So this makes water molecules bond to each other. An interesting experiment you can do, and this is kind of fun and neat. Get a penny, or it can be any coin. Lie it flat on the table. Start slowly and carefully adding drops of water to it. If you add drops of water onto the penny, and make a bet with your friends how many drops of water you can fit on the penny, you'll be amazed. When I do this in class, I have students get typically 30 to 40 drops of water on a penny. And the really neat thing is how high it builds up. You'll get this big dome forming on the penny of drops of water. And that's because all of the water molecules are sticking to each other. They're holding each other together in this big dome of water on the penny. Another interesting thing you can do is get two strips of paper and get them wet. If you have a strip of paper here and a strip of paper here and you get them wet so they're each kind of coated with some water and then you put these two strips of paper together, they'll stick to each other. Again, that's because the water molecules on each surface of paper are bonding to each other and then holding them together. So hydrogen bonds are very important in water and they also occur between water and other molecules. So hydrogen bonds hold water molecules together or to each other and they hold other molecules to water or even ions. For example, if we take that salt we made earlier, sodium chloride. If you mix this with water, water is attracted to the sodium and to the chlorine. So the salt will dissolve and dissociate in water. You'll have the sodium here, you'll have the chlorine here. The negative oxygen end of water molecules will attract to the sodium. And the positive hydrogen end of water molecules will attract to the chlorine. So hydrogen bonding holds water molecules to each other. It also holds water molecules to many other substances. As long as there's a charge, the water will be attracted to it. If it's a positive charge, the oxygen end of the water is attracted to it. If it's a negative charge, the hydrogen end of water is attracted to it. So just to review our three types of bonds, we have covalent is where you share electrons. You have ionic is when atoms give and receive electrons and hydrogen is positive and negative ends of molecules attract. Covalent and ionic are the ones that form molecules. Hydrogen bonds don't form molecules. Hydrogen bonds occur in molecules that already exist. Here we're going to look at how different types of molecules interact with water. 
So your body is mostly water. And you eat and drink. And every time you eat or drink, you take molecules into your body. And all of these molecules coming in have to interact with the water in your body. And there are some different ways they can interact. So that's what we're going to look at. I'm going to start here, number one, this picture up here. This is showing glucose. So the green things here represent glucose. Now glucose is just our example molecule. There's a lot of molecules that are going to behave this way. And this interaction, our first one, is polar, hydrophilic, non-electrolyte. So let's come down here and define that a little more. Something is polar, it has charges. And remember, water is also polar. Water has a positive end and a negative end. And charges, opposite charges, will attract to each other. So hydro means water, and phil means love. Think of Philadelphia as the city of brotherly love. So hydrophilic means it loves water, or it'll interact with water. Non-electrolyte means that it will not dissociate. So let's look at what happens when you put water or put glucose into water. So you start off your glucose you have C6H12O6. That's your molecule of glucose. There's your glucose. So that's what we have up here, this glucose. And it should actually, there we go. When you put it in water, the water molecules will attract to it. So we've got our water molecules here, and they are going to interact with it. So it will mix with water. This is dissolved. So the first thing that a polar hydrophilic non-electrolyte will do is dissolve. So it will mix with the water and it will form hydrogen bonds. So you're going to have bonds here connecting it to the water. These are hydrogen bonds. So you can see that up here. Here are the dots are the hydrogen bonds. Here's your glucose molecule, your C6H12O6. Here's your water. And they are forming hydrogen bonds with the glucose. That's dissolved. Notice that you still have a glucose molecule. So it does not dissociate. So not dissociate means that the atoms of the molecule stay together. So at the start, we had a glucose molecule. When you mix it with water, at the end, you just have a wet glucose molecule. So it dissolves only. Let's look at our next one now. Number two here, our example that we're going to use is salt, sodium chloride. And this one is a polar hydrophilic 
electrolyte. And we're going to go ahead and put acids and bases go on this list also. So if we look at what's happening with this one, So you already know what polar means, you already know what hydrophilic means. And if you know that non-electrolyte means it will not dissociate, electrolyte means it does dissociate. So if you start off with NaCl, this is a molecule. It's a sodium and a chloride bonded to each other as a molecule of table salt. You put it in water, so here's our water molecules. Okay, remember that the sodium, the sodium chloride is made of a positive sodium and a negative chloride atom. Water is positive at its hydrogen end, negative at its oxygen end. Look here at the picture. This one is the sodium, this one is the chloride. Notice that the negative oxygen ends of the water are pointed toward the sodium. The positive hydrogen ends of the water are pointed toward the chloride. So different parts of the water are attracted to different parts of the molecule. Notice the sodium and the chloride are separate from each other. We no longer have a molecule of salt we have two separate ions. We have the sodium ion and the chloride ion. So dissociate is when the atoms break apart. And when they do, you get ions. And ions conduct electricity. So that's why this is called an electrolyte. So this category of molecules will dissolve, they will first dissolve, and then they will dissociate. And when they do this, you get ions that conduct electricity. Our third one here, is hydrophobic. So this one is nonpolar hydrophobic. And this would be lipids. Notice there's no interaction going on with the water here. Here are your lipids, here is your water. And see how you have this double arrow? They are actually repelling away from each other. And that repelling away from each other is called hydrophobic exclusion. So if we come down here, and we'll describe this one a little more. So nonpolar, no charges, and phobic is fear. Remember, hydro is water. So it fears water. And you've probably seen this. If you put oil and water, the oil floats on top. It's very hard to get oil and water to mix with each other because they are repelled by each other. So anything that is nonpolar that has no charges is repelled by water. Matter, like uh, ducks can sit out in the rain and they don't get wet because they have oil on their feathers and that oil and the water repel each other. And the buck, duck is perfectly dry. Then our last one here is amphipathic.
So the way I remember this, think of amphi, think of an amphibian, like a frog. Well, hopefully you remember from grade school learning about science that a frog starts off as a tadpole in the water, and then it turns into a frog on the land. So an amphibian is part of its life with water, and then part of its life on the land. So it has two parts. One part's with water, one part is not with water. An amphipathic molecule has two parts. We look, for example, here at a phospholipid. One part is hydrophilic. So it will bond with water. The other part is hydrophobic. So it avoids water because it fears water. So if we look here, there's your phospholipids right there. Here is your water. And notice how the heads, the hydrophilic parts, the round parts, will touch water. The tails, the hydrophobic parts, will not touch water. So phospholipids are an example of this. Another important example in the body is bile. Bile is another important amphipathic molecule. It helps you to digest the fat that you eat. So there are your four ways that molecules can interact with water in your body. A little more about water. If you have a water molecule, it has the oxygen and the two hydrogens. Water molecules will dissociate. And they just do this randomly on their own. They dissociate. So remember, dissociate means that the atoms in a molecule break apart from each other. So one of the hydrogens breaks off. It's over here by itself now. Now think back to when we learned about the polar covalent bond. The hydrogen is loaning its electron to oxygen. When the hydrogen breaks off, oxygen keeps the electron. So that means hydrogen breaks off and it does not take its electron with it. That makes hydrogen have a positive charge because it has that one proton, but it has zero electrons because it left its electron with oxygen. This part, the oxygen and the one hydrogen, has a negative charge because it kept that electron. This is hydroxide. It's written OH minus and you call it hydroxide. This one, we write it as H+, plus and we call it hydrogen ion. If you have pure water, nothing else in it, whenever a molecule dissociates, you'll get one hydroxide and one hydrogen. So the ratio, if we count these and compare them to each other, we're going to put H plus in brackets here. That means concentration of hydrogen will be equal to the concentration of hydroxide. If we come up here and we look here at neutral, neutral solution is pure water. Okay, look at the hydrogens and hydroxides. There are four of each. So in pure water, hydrogen is equal to hydroxide. This is neutral, and neutral is 7 on the pH scale. It's right in the middle. If we talk about acids, an acid is any substance 
that when you mix it with water, it increases the hydrogen. So an acid donates hydrogens when mixed with water. So if we look at the acidic solution here, notice with the hydrogens, we have six of them. And with the hydroxides, there are two. So in an acid, hydrogen is greater than hydroxide. And the more hydrogen it donates, the stronger the acid. And the closer to zero the pH is. So for example, if we look at hydrochloric acid and wine, the hydrochloric acid is the stronger acid because it donates more hydrogens. If you look at coffee, coffee has a pH of five. Compare that to lemon juice with a pH of two. Which one do you think donates more hydrogens between coffee and lemon juice? It's lemon juice. Lemon juice is the stronger acid. It's closer to zero. Its pH is two, which is closer to zero than coffee's pH of five. So the lemon juice donates more hydrogen. What about milk versus coffee? Here, the milk's pH is 6.3 and the coffee is five. So milk is a weak acid. It only donates a few hydrogens. Now let's look at base. A base is something that binds hydrogen. So if we look at the beaker here with the base, notice we only have two hydrogens and we have six hydroxides. So if you have a base, your hydrogen concentration is less than your hydroxide concentration. And bases go up to 14 on the scale. And the more hydrogen it binds, the stronger the base. And the closer to 14. So if we look at bleach and ammonia, ammonia binds more hydrogens than bleach. If you look here, sodium hydroxide is all the way at 14. That is our strongest base because it binds the most hydrogen. Okay, here's human blood at 7.4. This is very important, keeping your blood at 7.4. <clears throat> So one of the reasons that pH is important in the body is that you have to keep your blood at 7.4. If your pH were to change, if it were to get below seven or above 7.8, 
you could die. That's getting into the fatal range. So you don't even have much room for movement. In fact, you need to stay 7.35 to 7.45 is the only safe range. So you're talking very small changes in pH. The reason this is so important is if it were to change, you would denature the proteins in your body. This basically makes your proteins not function anymore. And you cannot survive if your proteins don't function. So in order to keep your blood at 7.4, you have buffers, your lungs, and your kidneys all work to keep your blood 7.4. and that keeps you alive and healthy. Have you ever heard the saying, you are what you eat? Do you think that's actually true or is it just an old saying? Well, it is scientifically true. You really are what you eat. If you think about food, what is food? Food is made of molecules. And specifically, it is made of biological macromolecules. The main nutrients in food are protein, carbohydrates, and lipids, or fats. These are macromolecules, they're large molecules. So here you can see this is a picture of a macro molecule. Macro means large. So it is actually several smaller units linked together. You can see here are the individual units linked together. When you eat food, you digest it down into those individual units called monomers. So we can also call this a polymer because poly means many. It's many small units linked together. So when you eat food, you digest it. You use a process called hydrolysis. Lysis means to break. This is a word you see a lot in AMP. And hydro is water. So up here you can see this is a water molecule. You use water to break those food nutrients into monomers. And with protein, you're going to break it into amino acids. With carbs, you'll get glucose. And with lipids in general, you're going to get your triglycerides, which can also be broken into fatty acids and glycerol. In general, we're dealing with amino acids, glucose, and triglycerides in the body. So these now go into your blood. Your digestive system takes whatever you eat, it breaks it down, and it puts it into your blood. So this picture is representing what happens in your intestines, especially your small intestine. All these nutrients now, these monomers, go into your blood. So you're going to have amino acids, glucose, fatty acids in your blood. Your blood delivers it to your cells. So this is your cell your cells receive those monomers. So here are the monomers. They're these exact same monomers that you broke down in your digestive system that came from your food. So they are from your food. 
your cells then do a process called dehydration synthesis. So your cells receive the monomers that composed your food and they do dehydration synthesis so dehydration means you take water away there's that water molecule notice here the arrow was going in you were using water now you're gaining water so you take water away from the monomers that's the dehydration part so you take a hydrogen from one and a hydroxide from the other, you have an H and OH that gives you H2O. And synthesis means to make. That's another word we have a lot in AMP, synthesis. So what we're going to make is a polymer or a biological macromolecule. And again, just like your food is made of proteins, carbs, and lipids, so are you. You're going to make this into proteins, carbs, and lipids. But it's going to be the proteins, carbs, and lipids of your body. So you're going to do dehydration synthesis to build the macromolecules of your body. So you can kind of think of it like Legos. Suppose one kid builds a tower out of Legos. So we've got all these Legos and they're in the form of a tower here. So this is a Lego tower. Then another kid comes along, disassembles this, and so now we've got just individual Legos. And this kid says, well, I don't want a tower, I want a house or a car. This kid builds a Lego car. There you go. Pretend that looks like a car made of Legos. The point is, it's the same building blocks, the same pieces. So maybe this was like a cheeseburger, like in our picture up here. You don't actually look like a cheeseburger, but you use the pieces you got from the cheeseburger to make your tissues and the parts of your body. So that's how you are what you eat. So if we put this in context of the whole organization of life, right here, so here's an atom, here's a molecule, here is a macromolecule. This is what we just talked about. And then here's organelles. cells, and so on. Hopefully you know this by now from chapter one. And if we look at the main types of macromolecules, you have four main types of macromolecules that make your body. So we have proteins. Proteins are the most abundant macromolecule in your body. Now, water is the most abundant molecule, but water is not a macromolecule. So if you're just talking about macromolecules, it's protein. And proteins are defined as a chain of amino acids. So amino acid is the monomer that makes a protein that are folded and twisted into a 3D shape. And this 3D shape is the most important feature of a protein.
proteins function based on their feature or based on their shape. And you have to be careful with your proteins because you can change their shape. That is called denature. Denature is when you change a protein's shape. And if you do this, the protein no longer functions. Think about the key to your house. It has a specific shape. And if you bend the key, it's not going to unlock your door anymore. The key works because its shape fits your lock. And there are two things that will denature protein. A change in pH. That's why it's so important to keep your blood at 7.4. If the pH of your blood changes, you'll denature your proteins and then you'll die. Or exposure to heat. Think about cooking food. A raw egg is clear and runny. You put that egg in a hot skillet and it turns white and solid. That's because the heat is denaturing the protein in the egg. Proteins have many functions. You have enzymes, or protein, which enzymes are the workers of your body. They catalyze all the chemical reactions, keep those going. You have transport proteins that let things in and out of your cell. You have structural proteins. Kind of the framework of a lot of your body is protein, like the two by fours in a building. We move on. Our next one, carbohydrates. If you break this word down, carbo for carbon. Remember the periodic table, the elements, carbon. Hydrate, water. Which water is H2O? The basic formula of carbohydrate is CH2O. In general, most carbohydrates have one carbon, two hydrogens, one oxygen in that pattern. So like for example, glucose is C6H12O6. So it's the same ratio. Two hydrogens for each carbon and oxygen. The main function of carbohydrates is that they are your body's source of energy. So your cells use carbohydrates, specifically glucose, to make ATP. And glucose is something we're going to cover a lot in this class. Glucose is blood sugar. And when you eat other carbohydrates, you digest them to glucose. So even if you eat something that doesn't have sugar in it, but it has carbohydrates, like it has starch or it has some like sucrose or anything else, you're going to digest it into glucose. Then we can look at lipids. Lipids are fat, oil, and wax. The thing that all lipids have in common is they are hydrophobic. This means that they don't mix with water. So the most common thing you probably know about lipids is your adipose, which is just the scientific name for your body fat. And this is important. It stores energy. It also insulates to help keep you warm. And it cushions. Your organs, your internal organs, all have a little cushion of fat. They're wrapped in fat to cushion and protect them. You also have phospholipids that form your cell membrane. 
you have your steroid hormones, such as estrogen and testosterone. There's many others, this is just some examples you've probably heard of. Also, vitamin D. Vitamin D is considered a steroid hormone because you can make it. You might know like when you go out in the sun, your skin makes vitamin D. So it's a vitamin, it's also a steroid hormone. Cholesterol is also an important hormone. Or I'm sorry, cholesterol is an also important lipid. Cholesterol is in your cell membranes. And it is the starting point for your steroid hormones. So your cells use cholesterol to make steroid hormones. Then finally, we have your nucleic acid. This is DNA, RNA, and ATP. DNA, you probably have heard of this lots of times. This is your genetic material. Your genes are DNA. RNA will be covered a little more in chapter four. RNA basically helps your cells make protein. And you might associate RNA with DNA. That's because DNA is the code for protein. And RNA is kind of the middleman. So it works with DNA. And ATP is the energy currency of cells. This is what your cells use glucose, or they can use fats and other things, but they use your food to make ATP. And then that ATP is what powers the cell. There's more information in your book about these molecules. This is just a quick introduction to them, but you do need to make sure and read the section in the book that gives more information about these four macromolecules.